All right, guys, seven o'clock. I think we'll get started. Showtime. Yep, showtime. My name is Jody Summer. I'm the District 7 representative for North Dakota Game and Fish, and we welcome you all here tonight. I hope it's a good meeting. We'll go through the agenda. There will be a time for questions and we'll provide answers. With that, uh, we'd just like to recognize and thank Friends of Sakakawea. They are the group that has provided the, the coffee, the cookies, the beverages back there. So um, I guess let's all, I'll give them a hand. The representative that I was working with from Friends of Sakakawea has some medical things going on right now. So unfortunately he wasn't able to make it, but he would have been here otherwise. So with that, We'll kick it off and we'll let Jeff take over. All right, thanks, Jody. Appreciate that. And uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for being here tonight. Again, my name is Jeff Williams, Director, North Dakota Game and Fish Department. Uh, welcome you to the uh, District 7 Advisor Board meeting. This is our sixth meeting out of our eight meetings. We finish up next week up in uh, Esmond on Monday and then uh, go to Fordville on, on Tuesday. So. We did we kind of stretch things out a little bit more this year than what we have done in, in previous fall meetings. Um, maybe just tried something a little bit different with uh, uh, the timing and, you know, just know that that maybe hits folks a little bit different rather than doing them right after deer season and then cramming them into a couple week period of time. And um, seems like it's worked OK. Um, we know that obviously the fall meetings gets a lot of discussion with deer and those types of things, but we also know there's there's a lot of other things going on in the fall months too, to where uh, we thought we'd maybe try to engage the public a little bit with a little different, a little earlier on in the year. And, and so we started um, back in the end of October, our first meeting up in, in Carrington. And, you know, one of the other things that we maybe thought of when we, if we started the meetings a little bit early, we'd maybe be able to dodge a few weather events. Well, that didn't work real well for us. Our first, uh, Two out of the three meetings were impacted by weather. One of them we had to postpone up in Watford City. And, and so we just finished that one last week. So anyway, it's been good. As as you guys know, uh, uh, advisory board meetings, many, many familiar faces in here. Opportunity for the department to hear what's what's going on in all parts of the state. Uh, you know, we have eight meetings in the in the fall, eight meetings again in, in the spring. So again, it just gives the department an opportunity to go out to different areas across the state and visit with folks, hear about those local, uh, you know, the local issues that are in place. We all, all of us get plenty of, of screen time in our life nowadays and advisor board meetings still provide that opportunity for face-to-face -face discussion that, that takes place, um, again, 16 times a year across the state. Gives the department and advisor board members, I think a good, uh, a good snapshot of what's on people's mind, but, and also gives the opportunity for the department uh, to provide updates on what we're doing. And like we always talk about, the Game and Fish Department does not receive any appropriation from state state tax uh, or general fund in North Dakota. Department is operated on, on license fees, and then those license fees are matched with uh, federal matching dollars, excise taxes from the manu on the manufacturer for firearms, ammunition, archery equipment, and been a very successful system since 1937. So a uh, unique system in place and a, a user uh, user pay system that's always been very well supported by by sportsmen and women uh, across. So um, again, welcome to everybody. Um, one of the things I will say is obviously we we are live streaming and um, and so you know people just be aware of that. Um, but so what we do is for the first hour, we just open things up as far as hearing local input and local feedback of different issues going on. And then again, the second hour, we have a wide variety of agenda items take place as well. But before we get into that, I want to make sure to take the opportunity to have our staff introduce themselves. We're blessed in here in North Dakota with some very talented staff when it comes to our North Dakota Game and Fish Department. We remain the third smallest agency in the country. But we get an awful lot done um, and we always take a lot of pride in, in, our, in the dollars that we have, sportsmen's dollars, the majority of those dollars are going on the ground and going, um, going to projects and not necessarily to salary. So uh, I'll start up here with Greg. Good evening, folks. Uh, Greg Link, I'm the Chief of Conservation Communications here in, in Bismarck. Bill Haas, I'm Assistant Chief for Wildlife Division here in Bismarck. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. I'm Scott Peterson, Deputy Director here in Bismarck. 
Good evening, Scott Winkleman, Chief Game Warden. Brian Hosick, Business Operations Manager in Bismarck. Marty Eglin, Education Section Supervisor. Greg Freeman, Communications Supervisor in Bismarck. Greg Power Fisheries Chief here in Bismarck. Bruce Strapp, Conservation Section Supervisor. Charlie Bonson, Wildlife Veterinarian out of Bismarck. Uh, Paul Bailey, Fisheries Biologist here in Bismarck. Jens Johnson, Private Lands Biologist here in Bismarck. Corey Eric, I'm the District Game Warden for Burley County out of Bismarck. Levi Jacobson, I'm Wildlife Resource Management Supervisor here in Bismarck. Um, Jeff Seeger, the Warden Pilot. Jared Bland, Warden County and Sioux County Game Warden. Uh, Billy Ness from the Game Warden, I'm sort of like. Good evening, I'm Dan Halstead, District Wildlife Supervisor out of the Riverdale office. Thank you. Well, I'll kick it, kick it over to, to you folks. Talk to uh, see what we want to talk about. Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't hard. No, it was not. Uh, I heard some things today that were kind of upsetting about the bird flu and how it's affecting uh, the goose population. Uh, snow geese in particular, there, people are saying, uh, I just heard it today. I'm going to ask you guys, you guys are out in the field a lot more than I am. What the extent of it is? Is it affecting just the snow geese, or, or other waterfall being involved in? And like I say, the extent of it is it just down from Braddock to the calm areas where the larger part population of the snow goose migration is taking place, or, or what's going on there? Well, I guess I'll hit on a little bit and then turn it over to Charlie or, or Bill. But I mean, so yeah, obviously avian influenza. You know, again the. The latest strain anyway that has gone through and, and, and has definitely seen some some mortality in in wide variety of you know populations, even eagles, you know, there was um, but as far as this fall goes, I guess I'll I'll let maybe Charlie speak to that as far as uh, anything that you guys are seeing or collecting or hearing about. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um and to echo off of Jeb, so uh, it was December 2021. We had an introduction of this foreign Eurasian strain of influenza into North America, and um, it really cooked across the U.S. and manifests itself in North Dakota in the spring of 2022. If if you guys remember, across a lot of eastern North Dakota, there was literally dead birds falling out of the sky. It was kind of almost apocalyptic, um, and and so we had quite a few, uh, especially snow geese, but uh, things that eat snow geese, raptors. Um, you know, a handful of ducks, dabbling ducks. Um, and as those birds migrated through that spring out of the state and as birds dis uh, dispersed to where they weren't congregated, um, we saw a pretty rapid tail off in terms of mortality. Um, just kind of smoldered from there um, through last fall. We had kind of here or there mortality. Um, and really, we also, you know, interact with our neighboring jurisdictions quite a lot as well. And so, um, Going into this fall, we, we knew that there was still that virus circulating, but didn't seem to be um, killing a lot of birds. But um, but for whatever reason, about two weeks ago, we started to get more reports in, in North Dakota. Um, probably the most unique thing, you're right to point out Braddock, is Goose Lake near Braddock. Uh, there's probably about 2,000 dead geese uh, around there. Um, and that's far and away the, the exception to the rule. It's kind of unclear why there's that many dead uh, geese there. Um, partly it might have to do that they're just piling up there and as we're having a few dead birds flake off the back of the, the flock, that's where they're they're showing up. Um, moving away from, from Goose Lake, we've had just kind of odds and ends, maybe a handful there, one neurologic goose there, but um, but you know it certainly catches the attention of, of folks. It's It's quite odd to find you know, a goose walking in a circle in the middle of the road, but um, but if you pair that in terms or compare that to just how many snow geese are migrating through the state, it's really probably quite minimal. Um, I think you asked about other species. We have had a, a handful of other ducks, um, gulls, cormorants, but uh, but much like the beginning that spring of 2022, snow geese seem to be uh, most affected. Um, the last thing I'll say before I talk your guys' ears off about influenza is, um, you know, our waterfowl biologist Mike Szymanski kind of also speculates that these birds that are 
that are dying are probably the ones that are just overly stressed, uh, kind of in the back of the migration. Um, juveniles, ones that have just really been taxed over the last, you know, many, many weeks. Uh, we know that infection rate is probably widespread across these birds, um, but the ones that actually die is probably a smaller fraction. So. Yeah, I mean, I can't help but think about the story of what you heard from our advisory board member from Devil's Lake last spring. And as we all remember, of course, the snow and the never ending snow, but he was out moving snow with a snowblower and and uh, and his, his snowblower plugged up on him. And it was, you know, a rear snowblower on his tractor and it plugged up on him and he went out there and there was a snow goose in it. Oh, wow. And so, I mean, there were literally, you know, with that type of mortality that was going on last spring with, uh, you know, with that. But yeah, it seems to be mostly in snow geese. And I actually had a text uh, from an individual yesterday in the north end of Bismarck where there was a snow goose just up in a, in a business outside of a business, just, you know, acting strange, obviously not very often you see a snow goose doing things like that. So, um, you know, our enforcement folks went and picked it up and got it off, so. He was just looking for a parking spot. Oh yeah, yeah thanks Corey, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question, Jeff? Absolutely. Okay, sounds good. Brock. Um, the last legislative session, there was House Bill 1260 that was passed that had to do with depredation cow elk tags. Do you guys have any numbers on that? Like how many cow elk tags you guys gave out this year? Or um, like landowner satisfaction with that? And that's kind of how that worked. Yeah, Bill, why don't you, why don't you tackle that one? Yeah. Yeah, so a little bit of background information on that one. Uh, elk are doing really well in the state. Um, they're doing so well that uh, it got to the point where landowner landowner tolerance is is maybe at at, uh, at a peak. And so Turtle Mountains, uh, Pemina Gorge, up in that area, they're doing very well, especially. And so so we did hear from a lot of landowners that um, population is, is getting to where the tolerance is um, at their you know at that level. And so what we did is uh, worked with legislature for 1260. And what it is is a depredation tag um, that we're able to give to uh, landowners. Um, but one of the provisions of it was they need to provide free access uh, for hunting of elk on their property. Now that could be antlerless or whatever. So, <laughs> so anyways, we worked to put some guidelines together um, and the landowners need to provide a minimum of five, uh, access to five hunters on their property. And if they do that, then we'll provide them uh, antlerless tag. And so when we, uh, when we do that, uh, they have to hunt on their own property. And so that's uh, one of the provisions. But we had 36 landowners, I think it was, when I last looked here a few days ago, that have uh, participated in that. So, so yeah, so I think that's it's been very well received by um, landowners and as well from the hunters. So that's a lot of access that's been provided across the state. Do we know, do we have like any numbers, like how many elk were killed, like stemming from that? Because like if you have five hunters, yeah. You know, what's the success rate? Do we have any of those numbers? Not yet, but we certainly will be. And so that's one of the big uh, things that we'll do is we're going to survey each one of those hunters. Um, so one of the stipulations are that that hunt or that landowner needs to provide the tag number and the name of the hunter. And then we enter that into our database and that activates that tag. And so we're going to survey all of those hunters and, and just see how it worked. You know, did it? Um, and we'll get a good idea of success rates. Um, and all those type of things from that. So yeah, and then also we'll we'll definitely work with those landowners to to make sure uh, it's a good program. It's worked for them as well. But really, it, it, it's something that's been very well received for sure, and it's a it's been a good tool. Yeah, I've heard heard some positive comments from you know from landowners and, and hunters with it. And you know again, like like anything we do, it's not perfect, and it's not going to make everybody happy. But again, provides an opportunity there, I think, to where we can get some folks that obviously have a once in a lifetime license can maybe help with some access scenarios there, but then can also feel like that's a little more of a targeted approach for areas where landowners feel like there are too many elk on their property and they, they want to try to accomplish reducing, you know, some of that, some of that localized population. And then they can also be rewarded by, by having an elk license themselves. So, uh, you know, the things that we've heard again, I feel like it's, maybe it's been a decent solution to uh to an issue so yeah dusty yeah back to cwd you knew that <laughs> yes yeah i'm surprised you bring that up <laughs> yeah. so i want to talk about the prion hypothesis and why the narrative push is basically just based on being contagious 
we start digging into this and we start talking to biologists and veterinarians, pathologists all over the nation, deer farmers. I even reached out to Case Western, which for people in here don't know, they're the leading prion institute in the nation for prion human diseases. What I asked for was a picture of a prion under a microscope on a microscope <laughs> slide. They couldn't produce one. So then I just got to thinking, well, if the prion doesn't exist, let me talk to a pathologist, and the pathologist we're working with has done 32,000 autopsies, 20 million chemistries, on 454 different species, including humans. So I asked him, if, you know, is it contagious in any way, any form? He's like, not contagious whatsoever, because there's no such thing as a prion. And so I got to dig in some more and it's like, had, in order to be contagious, it's got to go through the Koch's postulates criteria. And it's never gone through the Koch's postulates criteria. as being an infectious agent, so it can be contagious. I keep digging, it's like, why are we not testing tongues and feces? We're continually being told how contagious it is. We're going after the lymph nodes, which lymph nodes filter bacteria, viruses, fungus. The ones we're supposed to send in are in the brain stem. And they even can collect nasal drainage. So I reached out to Case Western again about being contagious. There's not a single human neurological disease that's contagious. Not even Alzheimer's, dementia, not even CJD. I got a picture of CJD and CWD. You can see the white holes in the brain. I don't even know if anybody in the room can tell me which one's which. They're identical. <laughs> CJD is not contagious in bodily fluids. So what are we doing? CWD is not even contagious. You know, Dusty, you're you're certainly welcome, you know, to your opinion that you share on it. And this is an opinion. I, I know that facts. Well, not you one know, again, the department has reached out to me for the material, Jim. I'm looking at privately funded material where you guys look at federally funded material. We we continue to follow the best you know science that's out there and available you know on any any issue any disease issues that are out there and again you're you're welcome to your opinion you know, on those Dusty I'm I'm sorry we don't we don't share that opinion. Um, you know that opinion would be in the minority of, of nationwide experts when it comes to <laughs> specialists when it comes to disease issues but a million dollars you know, put towards the pre on Jeb and 50 years later, we still have nothing. And there are peer reviewed about nutrition out there. Again, I, and these are opinions. Your, your opinion is, these aren't opinions. is, is understood. Facts. I mean, as far as you're welcome to that, but again, it's, it, it isn't something that is shared by, by the science community across the country, Dusty. So I'm it's sorry. The, it's the only sorry. contagious neurological disease in history. Well, you know, again, the, the prion family of diseases are have differences with them. Yes, some are contagious, some are not. So, uh, prion on the microscopic slide. Yeah. Well, you know, again, there's there's plenty of plenty of research out there that that can yeah, show I that. Asked for it, it. So. I still haven't gotten it. Irrefutable <laughs> evidence that it's contagious, and I haven't gotten that from the department either. Well, you asked for some information, in Enderlin. We provided it to you. And, you know, again, you, you, you have that information that, that we sent. So appreciate your input. I don't know if you guys read it or not, but it's fibrils on the microscopic slide. They're not prions. Thank you. Oxidized protein. Yes, sir. Good question. Uh, the boat ramp in McLean Bottom down south got the one out with all that water coming through. Wait. Is there any chance they're going to try to replace that further to the south to create maybe a... Uh, a bowl of some sort so the water that's coming through isn't going to be fast and, and build another one or not. I haven't heard a thing on that. Well, oh, you're, you're aware that it is up and running again though, right? I mean that we that the boat ramp is it's there, but but it's one of those that <laughs> going by sure. you need help when you want to go and load your motor. Yeah. And stuff I I think it, it's a disaster it's too fast. I'm just thinking I fished there with shore fishing too and I was thinking that part of that could be Drain or pulled out, excavated so that it's easier to load and unload. Yeah, so you know, there's your tent. Yeah, um, so one of the things when that ramp was down, you know, there was lots of different options 
I, I shouldn't say options. There were there were other areas that were intensely explored in that area to, to try to see how how we could replace that program just because of the use that we know it gets, you know, especially in the spring. So um, it is there's no doubt. I mean, we there's, there's two things that with any type of Missouri River ramp systems, right? I mean, if you have one that's out of the current, then you're dealing with se sediment removal more. If you have it in the current, we obviously know people are dealing with the current a little bit more in that fast pacing uh, current that takes place in some of those areas. So um, it is. They did that went up uh, further to the north on the Mandan side. They <coughs> created it behind a, 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 a U, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah, that works fine. Yeah, like, like, like a jetty, Floyd, is that what you're thinking about? Huh? Like building a jetty out into the, well, you to could, create a backwater you know, area? I'm just saying that you could probably just see if there's a way to pull some of this other soil back, say 100 yards from where the existing was, leave that in place, because it'll help hold the, and then, um, so it's a, it's a deep water spot right there. What's going on there, it's, it's, okay. Not very good for one guy with one boat to try to get in and out. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't disagree with you. We feel pretty fortunate that it's even open now, though, too, right? Yeah. You know, and the fact that, you know, it's still going to be rowed away. You know, yeah. That. Well, yeah, I mean, it is. It's one of those things. We don't know how, what the situation is going to be there. And um, it definitely has stabilized some, you know, after it, you know, continued to, to road away at the, the sheet piling that was down and, you yeah. know, undercutting, yeah. kind of thought it was going to lose that whole area back there, but, you know, fortunately kind of settled to where we wouldn't have to, but you know, Greg, Paul, I don't know if you guys have anything more in addition to that, but. River ramps are a bugger. <laughs> they're, they're, they, they're a pain in a lot of people's barriers, especially the colonies that take care of them. Um, you mentioned one on the bandana. I assume you're talking about Little Heart. Yeah. Yeah, well, Little Hearts, somebody pays that bill too, right? Because there's so much sedimentation. It's like every other year we have to dredge at all. And there's a permitting issue that goes with that. I so less, that would happen. So, so yep. the less we can we need to get permits, the better off we are. Um, and so the best one, the river ramp <coughs> all its own over the years, is Wilton. I don't know if many people see Wilton, but that's a fairly low maintenance boat ramp. It's, but it's your challenge. Uh, it's it's in the current there too. So it's it's a problem. You know, we're looking at right now. We're looking at Fox, not Fox Island, uh, Kimball, the desert ramp, because that's been a problem. And hopefully, what we need to do there is actually shave off the old boat ramp hard point, and to get some scullery, because that's filling up with sediment. So it's it's a it's kind of a no win situation. When it comes to those. Things. We we understand what you're saying, but it's. Placement is critical. Placing, placing the, like Jeb was saying, some material out, rocks and such out to get a jetty would still be, wouldn't be helpful. Right now at the rifle range, that's, things have changed. We can't put another rock in there. Corps of Engineers, we've dumped tons over like, since 86. Yeah. We've dumped tons of, that's why we had to do that, that iron curtain there. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's. That's a tough, tough spot. But for time being, at least we have that. We feel fortunate. Worked with CORE and they gave us the green light to at least reopen it. So, yeah. I go to Craig Hazelton, so place I go now. Hazelton has the opposite issue. It's pretty silted in. Yeah. So I was going to say, yeah. at Hazelton, you got to oh, yeah, ease your way out of the south. But when the water gets back up yeah. to where it's supposed to be, you at least can get out into it. Yeah. And, I, you know, and even if we did have the availability to, put some, you know, to put a jetty in there. I mean, I, you know, that, I mean, that's deep water in there now too. I know it filled back in now some, but you're talking, man, yeah, that, that'd be an awful lot. That'd be a big, that'd be a big price tag on that project to be able to successfully do that with the depths that are there. And again, I, the core went out right. right at that spot. Yeah. Can I follow up with another yeah. one yeah. I got here? Um, I just thought of this the other day. Uh, when you apply for a beer tag, in for any any buck, any go, white tail no, mill deer no. You got that whole complex. Why not just have another one called any deer? Is that that be hard to do? Well, in, in some units, in some units we do, you know, we have any antler list or any antler. Yeah, but that's not any deer. Well, I, I guess I would kind of defeat the purpose of your <laughs> management goal, right? If we had it that way. Want to know the, yeah. the reason why? Yeah, I mean that would be that would be the reason why is that would 
we would lose some of that management ability in some of those areas as far as you know management associated with whether it be whitetail, whether it be mule deer, whether it be bucks, whether it be does, those types <laughs> of things. So, I, you know, I think it's one of those things. You know, again, growing up in the western part of the state, and you know, Montana has some. There's some positives with their system too, but there's also some some drawbacks, right? And you hear that fairly often too, as far as like eastern Montana, you know, deer numbers and you know the almost you know the lack of management or the lack of you know um, ability for them to manage some of those areas over there uh, due to it just being a general you know any tag over there and that certainly you can suffer some years then where your deer numbers are not very good and that's definitely been the case in eastern Montana for quite a while so okay so uh, speaking of going back to boat ramps is there any updates on the ramp plans for north of Mandan? um Greg, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, pro probably just, you know, we probably know what you've read, you know, Wayne, when it comes to the paper. I mean, there is a boat ramp going in and that in that car body site. And, um, you know, now it's just a matter of, you know, them getting the core approvals and permits and how quickly that can take. And, you know, we, we know from experience, sometimes that can be a little bit of a, a time lag to be able to get that done. But yeah, it is, it is definitely there something they're moving on. So. Yes, sir. So to go back to the deer situation, I'm just go down that road. My first question that'll lead to some more questions is, I, and I, I'm pretty sure I understand Game and Fish's structure right, that you guys are funded off of, of license fees, correct? Correct. Um, so I'm going to start the first question off with, to lead into the next questions is can we can you guys as an agency go after taxpayer dollars is it set up in the constitution that way and, and, and then i want to lead into some more questions with that question could we re, could we receive a general could you, fund could you take funding out of the general fund um if the legislature appropriated it to us we could okay um so going down that road um Corey the game warden over there I think him and I had a pretty good conversation last late winter about um deer population north of Bismarck and, and I'm sorry north of Bismarck yeah okay yeah and and I'll and I'll, I'll start this conversation off as you know, fairly avid outdoorsman and and I'm a rancher northeast of Bismarck and have lots and lots and lots of <laughs> friends and family that are big landowners and, and understand the deer population probably I, I don't even mean to say this to you guys but better than you guys do understood um and where i'm going with this is we have to you you guys as an agency need to do something about this deer population in this state and i and i might be wrong in this room but i'm, I'm guessing i'm not um, I'm a landowner and a rancher in 2J1, so right here. Um, I've hunted 3D3 for 25 years, 10 miles north of Bismarck. Um, I've watched this deer population decline. BHD hit us at the kneecaps and took everything out. Um, I am here to tell you as a rancher and a landowner, 2J1 west of Highway 14 should have been shut down, period. 3B3, I just left a landowner's, um, a landowner's place for a job meeting within 10 miles of Bismarck. In the last two years, this many white-tail deer on trail cameras in his yard. He owns 100 acres of property that my dad sitting next to me will tell you we've hunted it that surrounding properties for 20 years and I know there's at least one other gentleman in the room that other hunts the surrounding property. Um, one white-tailed deer in two years. Um, Corey and I had a conversation about dead deer on Highway 83. If he remembers me. I do. Um, and it did, it got to be a pretty heated conversation because I called as a concerned outdoorsman, a concerned citizen, 
that we had deer get run over on the highway in epic proportion because of human intervention. And I asked the agency to come up and move them deer off the highway. And I, if Corey remembers the conversation, I had all the landowner contact information that we could have pushed them deer all the way down on the burnt creek. And the agency could have put eight bales out for them and done anything to get them deer. I watched 17 deer get run over by cars in 14 days and three 100% total out cars. I drive the route every day. Um, was this during so the winter time? Yeah, it was. Um, they were, they started by eating green grass in people's yards and people felt sorry for them and they got fed and they were fedding on one side of the highway and coming across to feed on the other side of the highway. In the reason, my first question about taxpayer dollars was, in Fori, I, I think I told you exactly this. I told you when you called your counterparts in town to tell them to stop following the dollar and follow the science, these deer are gone. Um, whatever biologist it was that called me after our conversation said the loss was 60 to 70% from EHD. I can tell you with a certainty, Jim, that you better find people that can count their fingers on their hands because that number is old. BHD, the landowner tonight said 98%. I could give you landowner numbers from Bismarck all the way to the Garrison Dam that will tell you it's north of 90%. I have a landowner that I know as a personal friend and my in-laws live on the property <laughs> um, right north of Bismarck. There's 1,400 acres of river bottom property there is 10 white deer left on that property this year. I live northeast of Bismarck. I had a neighbor that, bless his soul, he's dead and gone now, drove his wife to Bismarck for dialysis for eight months and never saw a deer cross the road in eight months in the last two years. <coughs> Why are we giving tags out? I looked at it today. We gave out 600 buck tags and 800 doe tags in 2J1 this year. Why? And why can't we segregate them units? East of 14, not that bad. I could, he's not here right now, but I could give you a landowner in, in 2F1. Or 2F1? Down south of Highway 6. The east half of that unit is decimated. They had EHD the year before. He asked me every day, he's got 9,000 acres of private land. He will not let anybody hunt because his response is, as a landowner, game and fish isn't going to do their job. I need to give these deer a sanctuary to live on. All right, so, so let, let me let me finish. All right, you can respond. I'm that. just trying to keep up. You're covering yep. a lot of ground, so yep. I'm trying to. Yep, you go ahead and I'll, I'll pick back up. All right, so. Obviously, the EHD outbreak that we had was was tough, right? I mean, and it was it, it came as far as east as we've seen, especially that mortality rate. Um, you know, EHD for folks that live in the southwest part of the state, something that they've been used to for quite a while. See it come through every seven to eight years. Mortality rate can be and is, you know, really high in certain areas of the units just gets to be kind of a known thing, right? You say to yourself, well, all right, you don't go down to Harry's this year. You know, he had that that outbreak, but you know, up at Jim's, they didn't, they weren't impacted at all. That's the, that's the, that's the challenge with the HD. Now, again, we knew, and you're pointing it out that there, that there was definitely some, ex, some excessive mortality in some of those areas. I mean, we didn't have a hard frost until October 28th that year. And that's, you know, that just causes that, you know, the vector to continue to, you know, cause that mortality. But I also want to point out is we were only a couple years from having really high deer numbers in that area. I mean, we had herd reduction area in that area from, from landowners that came to us and saying, holy cow, we need to do something here. Well, 
probably went a little overboard, obviously, obviously with the HD, but you know, we, we still need to maintain, you know, and again, in some of those areas, we haven't issued any white tail tags. I only know one unit, Joe. What, yeah. what other unit? Have well, I'm just saying, you know, for that area, for the area you're talking about, right north of, you know, right north of Bismarck, so that, I mean, we haven't tags. issued any white tails for the last <laughs> two years. Any white tail tags? 3B3 has always had white tail tags. Yes. Well, which you, I, I, 3C, 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 3C
and I guess I'll rephrase it. In these yep. units that we have a sustainable mule deer. Population. Oh, yep, the mule deer thing. Yep. Why don't we manage them? Right. Because so. What I saw is yep. Unmanageable. Right. So, just for everybody's information, mule deer have been doing well as they move further east in the state in recent years. Right. That we did have. Um, some favorable weather for a while and it been done better and better and better and so what we have found is that exact situation that you indicated where oftentimes in this eastern state eastern part of the state that landowners are going to protect those meal deer and we do have those pockets it doesn't it isn't impacted as much as the numbers of tags that we issue because they do get protected um but but also they are pretty susceptible to to tough winters and in that 2j1 unit that you're in that you're talking about we had substantial loss of mule deer. So we, when we flew that unit uh, in early January, um, and then we reflew that in April, we saw just a hair over 50% reduction in whitetails, but we saw over an 80, 85% reduction in mule deer. And that's the reality of it. We could protect them all we want in the Northeast part of the state, but if we do that, in the end, we're likely to, to, to lose them anyways. And so, so that's kind of where we're at with it. Uh, another, another part of that, that, that you which would want to consider is how our non-resident tag allocation works for archery hunting is related to how many mule deer tags that we give out as well. So um, if we want to do that, that might take a little bit of change because right now it's 15% of the previous year's uh, mule deer out tag allocation. But in the end though, it's, it's not something that we've talked about it. It's definitely something that's been brought up, but in the end, you know, it's been working pretty good with the any tags um the way the way it's been right now and so I, so we feel comfortable with uh, the system we're at so so my my and, and i i'm sorry to get long <laughs> but the other portion of that for this this mule deer management side of it you know east eastern part of the state is is, is trophy management um and 3v3 i think is a prime example of we, we have, not only do you have a sustainable mule deer herd, but you also have trophy management in that, in this unit northwest of Bismarck because you have a limited number of any antler tags. Um, 2J1, I mean, and, uh, and I'm speaking from a landowner perspective, I mean, these, deer, these mule deer get harassed mm -hmm. excessively. Um, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a flat ladder, I see white tail horns, and then I see mule deer horns and a mule deer, so mule deer antlers of any yeah. avid hunter in the room knows that an average set of mule deer antlers look like a giant set of whitetail antlers. Right. And that, that's really from a, from a, you know, conservationist, landowner, hunter point of view, like the, these units that have a sustainable herd of mule deer in them, um, why can't we manage them? Why can't you guys manage them like 3B3 is right. a prime example? To right. allow that that herd to thrive, thrive and, and be, give, give us some trophy potential. Yeah, I mean, that, I guess it, yeah, it comes down to our philosophy of that. You know, as you get further east and northeast, you do start seeing them, but we do get those corrections from Mother Nature. No matter what we do with management, it's going to knock them back. Um, and if we would have done that over the years and we had more mule deer, I hate to say it, but they'd have gone to waste. Um, and so. And it, and it's, I mean, some of that area, I mean. Obviously, there wouldn't be mule deer there if there wasn't some mule deer habitat, but it's marginal, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, some of that's, I mean, it, it's just not going to be, you know, consistent, sustainable to where it's going to be it's like, like a management like we have in the western part of the state. Not to cut you off, but it's kind of loaded. I mean, when you, it has been marginal. Anybody in the room that hunts western North Dakota excessively would probably tell you that these mule deer are found more in that fringe country than they are in the rough country. Um, that's I mean, at times, you know, again, at, at times, probably yeah. more so than not. Yeah. One other thing I was going to hit on quick too, going way back to the beginning, that incident that you're talking about on Highway 83. Interesting enough, like you said, it was feeding and it was well intended citizens doing that that in the end was causing that. So I think that was one that Levi went out and visited with, uh, with the folks that were putting the feed out. They stopped doing it and the deer stopped going across the highway and getting hit. And so certainly appreciate you and others bringing that to our attention right away. Thank you. Scott. Going along with a little bit of what he's talking about, is it possible with the youth season that we have for white tails from the 11 to 13 year old, consider mule deer? 
lot of my students and parents that have gone through my classes and stuff, that's what I've gotten back from them. They really hunted last fall and some of the early scouting. Land owners like to see some of the mule those harvested. Kids can't, you know, it's a way till only. Is that a possibility of opening some of that up for some of those more areas from west and south in Missouri? Like for me, if I could allow some of my youth hunters, you know, I've got 30 to 40, 50 mule deer in my area, you know, on our property and our neighbor's property, we can afford to have some harvest. Yeah. Is, is that a possibility that we can look at for next season or? It's possible. It would take a legislative change to do okay. it. And, you know, so again, it's, it's possible, um, you know, when that season was put into place, um, the timing of it was also as when we had, you know, really high whitetail numbers as well. And there, there's just, there's always general sensitivity associated with mule deer, right? Just with the fragile nature of them. And so there gets to be some of that discussion that comes into it, that came into it during that, during actually the legislative session where people just felt, you know, they wanted, they didn't, they didn't want that. They wanted more control over that to where mule deer weren't included in that just because of the sensitive nature. So, but I mean, we've had that discussion too, is that, you know, in certain areas and certain, certain years, I, you know, especially from a youth opportunity, that first experience in being able to harvest a mule deer is a lot of times a heck of a lot easier experience than a whitetail. But again, then that also enters the sensitivity sometimes of, you know, taking additional mule deer does out to where areas to where people don't necessarily want that either. So over but, the approximate 25 years that we've hosted youth hunter, I'd say we've harvested close to 75 deer. Yeah. I've had some kids that their first year, you know, they come up the farmyard and they're asking for next year. Right. I try to accommodate that, but obviously the last two or three years, I've had none. Like you said, we went from seeing me in the morning or the hunt 75 to 100 whitetails and probably 40 or 50 new leads to last year, two or three whitetails. Yeah. All the neighbors we've kind of got together, and, you know, try not to shoot the does if possible. Obviously, some of them still get the youth hunters that come in and do our darndest to help them get deer. You know, yeah. Just so, I, I do want to point out, thank you, Scott, for all the you know work you've done with allowing youth hunters on your property and you know hunters in general. And um, and it is something too. You know, there, there's a our, our district advisory board member uh, from from Keene. He has a constituent up there who brought up you know this issue and. And, and it's understandable, especially after we had the EHD die off and to where, you know, then you have some youth in some areas that, you know, when you don't have the details and they're sitting with, uh, now granted, they could go anywhere in the state, you know, all that goes with, you know, the sometimes, you know, the, the busy schedules, those types of things for, for those uh, for those young gals and guys. But um, we did talk about in between legislative sessions here, sitting down and looking at that issue to see if there maybe could be something that could be put in place there with, you know, keeping some safeguards on, you know, some mule deer doe harvest type thing, because we know people are concerned about that issue, um, but yet also still maybe providing some of that opportunity. And so I think it's a good question. It's good input. Uh, others have it. And, and again, we've agreed to sit down and, and at least talk about and see if there's some some potential there of how that we could make that work. And just a follow up with our muzzleloader. Is it possible, and again, probably to the legislature, to have a muzzleloader mule deer season? Is that? Well, you answered your question is yes, it would have to be through, uh, you know, white muzzleloader season is whitetail only, and uh, it, would, it would have to be, yes, approved through the legislature. And again, you, it's kind of the same discussion. You bring in some sensitivity there with obviously with you know, limited meal deer numbers in, in some areas, so. Has there been any discussion at all um, with kind of getting back to waterfall with, uh, you know, too many non-resident hunters coming in and too much pressure moving birds out of the state? Has there been any conversation on that? We heard about it up in Carrington at our advisory board meeting in, in Carrington about, you know, non-resident pressure. And, um, you know, there's there's no doubt in the last, 
we, we'd been about 20,000 non-resident waterfall hunters <laughs> for a period of time. You know, we went through, you know, probably 15 years ago when there was a lot of, um, you know, some some legislative battles on non-resident non-resident hunters. And at that point in time, there were some years where there was close to 30,000 non-resident hunters. Well, you know, over time, it kind of kind of corrected itself a little bit. And, you know, we've been staying around 20,000 non-resident hunters. Well, then when COVID came and the border got shut down, we, we saw a spike here in North Dakota. I mean, if if you're not going to go to, you know, Prairie Canada to hunt ducks or geese, where else are you going to go? And so a lot of those folks chose North Dakota. And so now we've, for the last couple of years, we've been around that 24,000 mark when it comes to non-resident waterfall hunting. And um, yeah, is there is there some pressure issues out there? Uh, certainly is. I mean, it, the, the competition is getting more and more, obviously, especially for field hunting spots and, and areas. You know, we've been pretty fortunate now here over the last several weeks where, you know, weather-wise, we've been actually able to hold some birds a little bit longer and maybe not blowing everything out of the state, um, you know, due to some weather. But um, to answer your question, yeah. I mean, has there been, you know, input or conversations about it? Yes. Um, just it also gets to be a again a, a sensitive issue because it's there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of parts in that conversation you know you enter in you know the economics associated with non-resident hunters and you know so basically what it comes down to is it's not just us having that conversation when it when it comes to that issue you enter in a lot of other folks that um where you have to try to assume that balance right? so i guess i'm gonna ask you i mean you're you're obviously seeing some seeing some pressure in, in the areas or as far as competition to finding those places to hunt? I know we have like their that two week rule where they can only come for you know, a week at a time, come back or whatever for another week. But it just seems like they're all coming at the same, you know, so whether it's, it's 20, 20,000, 25,000, whatever the number is, it's not like they're spread out throughout a season. You know the seasons you know whatever three three and a half months long they're all coming in those same three when months. it's good right yeah yeah you know we all know when that is and yeah obviously it depends too sometimes you get these odd weather storms that throw a wrench of things but yeah it just seems like they're always here at the same find a couple weeks and you know it's competition just out there you're running around scouting and and just pick up after pickup and yeah, yeah it's that legislative action no we that? could i mean we, we could do it you know through a proclamation <clears throat> you know it's like a lot of things we could but you know again there's you know then there probably be some other other action associated with that and this is this is one of those issues obviously that you know there's a there's just there's a lot going on you know with it and, and a lot of people that want to have part of that discussion and and it and there's many people in the room that remember, and I can't even remember what legislative years those were, but it, yeah, there was, the Capitol was, oh, one and oh, three. yeah, was full, you know, I mean, people coming on buses when it comes to, you know, the non-resident, you know, legislative issues and those types of things. So it was, it was very active and, and um, created an awful lot of discussion out there. So, but. It's good input and good good thoughts. It's just a man again, you know, and there and I should I guess I should say though too, I mean there there are two seven day periods for, for non resident waterfall hunters. And so, you know, they have the ability and you know, again, in, in, in our day and age with technology, those types of things, obviously they a lot of people, at least if they're, you know, pretty nimble with their schedule anyway and and can come when, you know, they get some good tips. I mean, it allows them that ability to, to do that. And so they can, you know, they can set those dates or they can, you know, even allow it. There's a, a date change that they can allow on there as well, too. So, um, you know, they can't be here all season long. But, you know, like you said, with with waterfall hunting, generally speaking, usually it's a it's a pretty narrow window when most people want to be out there. So. Gary. Speaking of the habitat issue, <clears throat> which we all know is pretty critical. How is the metal art program going for signups and then the program that you guys have now where landowners can get your assistance and help for putting habitat on their land as they don't have access? How are those programs going and getting much interest in landowners? I'll, I'll let Greg 
speak to that. And when it comes to Metal Arc Initiative, yeah, there's been a lot of interest and, and a good interest. And again, like Bill mentioned, Habitat's the key for us. And the more we can do associated with Habitat, working with with landowners from a, you know a standpoint of uh, of that interest, the, the better we can be. So, and what Gary is referring to when <clears throat> when he talks about the Metal Arc Initiative, we have talked about it here in the past couple of years. It's really our our native grass conservation effort, but it's a coalition. It's kind of all hands on deck, and that partnership continues to grow. We continue to have uh, more folks, more folks coming into the arena and helping us out with that. Um, and I think there's, I mean, it's got a lot of different aspects. One of it's just awareness, right? Um, but it's also then helping support our landowners, um, support our ranching community keeping them on the landscape, keeping them successful. If they're successful, that habitat's going to be there. And that's what we, we're really just trying to keep it green side up, right? So uh, so there's a lot of different practices, a lot of different everything from fencing and watering systems to to, to graze in a more uh, rejuvenative, rejuvenative way. Um, but it's also putting some marginal cropland um, here and there, trying to round things out, expand things, connect things again. Um, we talked about that, I think, last last year. The thing is, is that we've had some real positive. Um, we put in for a grant um, last July for another 2.5 million, not another, but for a different tool, uh, West River. We'd like to uh, uh, work with ranchers um, that want to keep their grass green side up and uh, we have a 30 year conservation agreement that again kind of for their lifetime or while well, they're an operator make that decision that they kind of want to keep it that way and it gives them an ability to get a little more income to either expand their operation or but it gives them a little bit of of uh, ability to, to generate some additional dollars so that's one thing we're doing but we also uh, I know I think we talked about the USDA RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. We've gotten 10 million um, into the state for USDA <clears throat> um, two and a half years ago um, to, to again to do these practices on the landscape. Um, we've used up those dollars. Uh, it was a three year, it was a five year period that we used up uh, in half that amount. We used up our dollars. So we went back to the well. Um, to get refueled, and we're supposed to be hearing about that here in the next couple of weeks. I think pretty positive we'll get that, so it'll be a recharge to keep keep on a truck. And so, like, it's all good news, but my gosh, we got a long ways to go. <laughs> so much to do um, to really take care of what you know the business and hand. We continue to lose. We get a report every year. And we continue to to lose that 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 native grassland that's so important to us. So, there you go. No. But how about the, are you getting much interest with <clears throat> landowners that do that or even other types of programs, but they don't have to allow access? Right. Is that yep. coming along pretty yep. good? Yep, there's no access with any of these. It's an option. It's always an option. It's, they can stack it on top if they want, make some more dollars for public access. But none of these, none of these within the Metal Arc Initiative, it's really about that habitat, just keeping that habitat base there. As far as that other question you had about the, the kind of that extra shot of dollars for habitat based programs, I don't know if you, if yeah, you want can, to talk about it. Yeah, I can do that. Answer. Yeah, maybe what you're talking about, Gary, is like in our private lands program. Um, we've always thought of that as plots, right? It's plots, everything is, when we do habitat work, it's it's access. And so that's still our focus. That's that's most of what we do. But we have just a little bit of money, if you kind of remember, like our Saver Lakes program. Kind of like that, but really focused on very high priority areas that we're going to start to look at getting fun, some funding sources through our private lands program to to do some access or habitat work that maybe would ju wouldn't necessarily require um, the access like our plots program. And so right now, we just hired that position and we're we're figuring we're putting the guidelines together for that. So we really haven't signed anything up with that program yet. That's just getting going. But it'll be very minimal in the scheme of things. Like I said, that part will be very focused. It's still our plots program with access is, is our bread and butter. So I think we're going to um, kind of 
segue into the second half of the agenda. And there's some things on the, I hope that everybody got a copy of the agenda that we want to get out to the public, get some feedback on. One of those, we're not actually going in order because I'm going to go first and then I think I'm going to let uh, uh, Greg Power come up and give a fisheries update. But one of the things on your agenda talks about providing uh, printed guides. So historically, for all of the licenses that, that involved a lottery, or another way to think about it is for all the licenses where we have to drop a tag in the mail in an envelope and mail it to you, we have typically provided uh, a, a printed copy of the hunting guide that goes along with that. So we're talking about things like deer lottery, um, the big three, spring turkey, fall turkey, pronghorn. And so <clears throat> I don't know how many people noticed that you did not get a printed deer hunting guide with your license I noticed this year? That. Show of hands, how many noticed that? Um, <laughs> Daryl, <laughs> that's probably because you don't ever open your envelope, Daryl, but you're the exception, not the rule. You know, it, 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 first of all, I want to tell you that, that we didn't receive a huge amount of backlash about that. And when we've asked this question at other advisory board meetings, the reason for that is that, you know, the vast majority of the people aren't actually referring to that printed guide. Now, this year, for those people who wanted one and, and will likely continue this into the future, if you want a printed guide, we'll be happy to drop it in the mail for you. You could go to one of our district offices and, and quite possibly, or at least potentially, some of our major vendors will have them. You can pick them up there. What we did this year instead was that we prevent, provided an insert. It looks just like that in your, in your envelope, which had a website on there which directed you to the site where you could find those. In the one of the things, I guess the reason I'm talking to you about this today is that, that it, we started thinking about the fact that this may be a good time to consider not spending the time and the money to print guides and drop it in all those envelopes if if you know if the vast majority of people are not using it. Now now we know that that a lot of folks are still using it, but the trend for us uh, is that we are, pro are providing um, less printing uh, products because the demand is going down. And I think we can talk about uh, fishing guides, plots. You know, people are getting used to using your 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 mobile phone for getting that information. Just like when we went to paperless deer applications, right? Uh, some folks found that a little challenging, but we don't hear too much grumbling about that anymore. Everybody kind of got used to doing that. So. We just think it's it's time to start considering whether or not we want to provide printed guides in everybody's with in all those envelopes with your guides. And so what we're thinking about doing is 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 doing something like this and maybe even enhance that a little bit by putting a QR code on there. And, and I'll tell you that everybody in the department in this room would tell you that when when people at Game of Fish have IT problems, I'm not the person they come to. I'm not the most techie person in the department. I'm, I'm probably one of the least, but even I know how to operate a, a cell phone to get a QR code, and that would take you directly to that guy. Sure. A lot of people refer to it as a proclamation that they're, they're two separate uh, animals, but it's the deer hunting guide. And so, you know, we're just, again, it's it, it's not a decision that's been made, but we're, 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 we're considering proc. Could you put that QR code right on the tag, put one for the proclamation? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> See, that piece of paper. You know, that, I'd like to know that too, Brian. I'll use this. As That's a, one of the ideas I was going to bring up. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll use this as an opportunity to kind of plug our, our native mobile apps. So we did release that next, or we I'm released that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Yeah, um, we did release our native mobile app um, last 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 January, I think. So. Um, and that was one of the things that came up was putting the guides and regs on there. And that was a piece that we thought that um, you can you can choose those even proclamations are on there. You can choose those on that mobile app and it'll download it to the device so that you don't have to have cell service to, to refer to those. And it, it just presents it a little more friendly. Um, it doesn't take the zooming and pinching and all that stuff to go read it all. So um, that is an option. And then if there's any ever any changes on that, it'll automatically update it for you. When there's a when the next season comes out or the next release of that guide comes out, it'll pull it back down to the device for you. So every time you check in, it just goes to see if you have that on your device. So um, it does. Yeah, that's something I think would be a great tool. Um, 
we, we do have other means to kind of get that information out there and navigate you directly to a website, but I think we're going to see some more traffic using the automated guides on the on the mobile app. So. Super. Do you want to go ahead and cover the refund and the electronic posting? Oh, yeah. Too, um, yeah, a little update on we can go to uh, electronic posting. Um, so many of you are aware this is probably this is our third year. Um, we started off with that first year was about three point. 3.4 million acres um, were uh, enrolled in electronically electronic posting. Uh, the next year it turned into 7.4, I think, and then this last year it was about 9.8. So we're seeing more interest. I don't know if that's, I'm sure it is. It's word of mouth that's spreading. Um, landowners find it a convenience, and then as well as the, all the just the new, it's a new thing for for folks. We understand that they're gonna see how that works for them. For hunters too, the same thing. What what tools are available? Again, we have the mobile apps and there's a, there's numerous applications that we refer to on our website for hunters to use, as well as material that material for folks that don't want to use technology. So we continue to kind of promote those for those that want to use it to, to find that. But um, yeah, it's going to imagine it's going to continue to grow. It is something that uh, folks find it convenience to to post compared to physical posting. I would say probably based on our estimates of um, prior to e-posting, we probably estimate anywhere between 25 and 28 million lands are physically posted. And so if we're at 10, I'd say we're about a third of the third of the way there. So about a third has probably adopted that as a means to post. Um, also with that, um, we had the um, the communication piece. So if you if you recall in the e-posting that you can they they can include their phone number or emails a point, point of contact or if there's an alternate point of contact. Again, we have a lot of we have a lot of non-resident landowners, trust partnerships, trust life estates, where it's really difficult to find out who that point of contact is. And so that's something that e-postings offer. And I think it's the first first couple of years that that re, uh, resulted in about 56 percent of landowners included contact information. And this last year we were sitting at about 58. So um, definitely heard some positive things from that. We've heard some of that even at the other advisory board meetings where. Landowners got, you know, had, had hunters contacted and made them and made arrangements to to hunt. So um, understand access is an important thing there. So fostering that line of communication is something that's pretty important. And that's again, that's the, the the biggest piece of the post is that is that that relationship and building that communication. When it comes to that, this is the first year we did that with our property. Is there any way where that landowner can simply say? Land is electronically posted, but if you're a youth hunter, contact. Is there is be a way where that that landowner can right when he when he we, does that can yeah. put something on there where if it's a youth hunter or a veteran or a disabled person, right. the landowner is more likely to have access for somebody right. who doesn't have a place to hunt. Yeah, we we talked uh, we talked about a number of things during that study and and imp the implementation of that from putting in big comment boxes for folks to type in whatever they want, what you can hunt, things like that. It just it got fairly complicated. You can imagine too with you know saying that you know you can hunt coyotes but not deer and then enforcement has a, a fun fun challenge to try to figure that one out, but <laughs> Um, yeah, we're 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 going to continue. We're continuing to look at it and just try to find ways to improve that. We have talked about some other tools very similar to that that maybe be maybe uh, a little separate from e-posting. Um, some other states kind of call it a hunter finder, things like that. We've in the past kind of a uh, two different things. One was a hunter contact system that we used in the past for kind of depredation issues. We've also used the uh, IO cataloger. You know, we had something like that that folks participated in. But the gist of it is, is you know, I I have some critters and I'd like to find some hunters. If I, here's where I live. And and so the, the, the same idea I think could apply with the like the way that electronic posting is delivered. Here's my here's my land. I need this. And then all of a sudden people call you and I can turn it off. The nice thing about separating that from posting is I can I can turn it on and off at will. Where we get a little difficulty with that with the trespass related issues and the print material and the distribution of all this because there's penalties involved, right? So yeah, it gets a little complicated with that, but we're still looking at a lot of different communication tools um, to kind of just improve it. And that communication is another one that's come up as of late. Um, for those that have some difficulty publishing their cell phone number or their email or the time that they respond to those. And so I, many of you probably use BizMan online and you have the option to 
sell some merchandise and say, I want to be communicated through Bizman. I don't care to share my phone number, email. When someone's interested in buying that product, I'll get a little ping saying you have mail, right? So. What information do you available on Avenza too, or just Onyx? So um, the contact information, yeah. the contact information, we have a variety of apps. So it is available on Onyx. So they consume that regularly. I don't know what duration Onyx is pulling that stuff over from the state. Um, we do have a couple other apps. We have our hunting atlas that does the same thing. It, it'll, it'll give you all that, what I call kind of the built-in white pages. I want to click on a feature and have it be smart enough to tell me what's there. A, uh, a Venza, that's like your old, that's just like scanning the plots guide. The nice thing about that is, is it works offline because you just, you, it'll show you your GPS location, show you where you're at on the map, but it doesn't have all the built-in smarts of that because you, you may not have service, right? This is a big scanned in poster, but it is useful as another tool. And these are, these are free tools. So I certainly encourage folks to put all of them on their phone and, and kind of use them to see what they think. So um, cover all this. Any other questions on e-posting? The other op, the other topic was refunds. refunds. All right, so there will be something new this January. Um, Many of you are familiar when you go through our online services to go check out and just when you think you finally nailed all the credit cards with American Express and Discover and all these things, then the next generation comes in and asks for like Venmo, PayPal, Google, and Apple Pay, right? So, um, yeah. <laughs> so, and I, and I think there's even e-check for people that don't want to use a credit card. So I guess you can put your routing number in there and things like that. So, um, there's some no, there's additional options in these newer payment processors, and so we are working with we do work with the Bank of North Dakota, and Chase is the is the vendor that we use to kind of uh, do our payment processing. So a lot of that's changing, but it's going to bring some more features for you to make payment, just like a lot of the online resources today, so that you can save your credit card information and all that other stuff, pick different payment methods. I don't know how all the Venmo stuff's going to work. It'll be it'll be new, but. Um, but yeah, just give it, giving those other options out there for folks to pay. The other thing that's changing with that is how lotteries are run. And so we've, in the past, we've collected payment up front for a lottery. And then we go through the process of preparing that lottery to run, running it, and finding a bunch of people that are unsuccessful and have to do a pile of refunds, which are, it's not a lot of fun, nor is it common practice to do it that way. So, um, when we moved online, that was one of the big perks is we wanted to go online for the reason of turning that lot of those lottery results around faster. I think we accomplished that part. There's still some, some other um, obstacles like that, but refunds is part of that process. And so we will be, you will come into the lottery and apply and not have to purchase that, pay for the lottery at that, or pay for that license at that time. If successful, we will charge your card at that time. So. Uh, we don't store credit card information. We never have and don't really want to. Um, we trust those payment processors to do all that. So you'll see a little bit of changes on there come come January for the new licensing licensing system. So are we going to miss out on a lot of interest? Because of <laughs> that was we, we used to get that a lot was uh, Game and Fish holds on and takes so long to run the lotteries because we like to make the twenty two dollars of interest every year. But no, hopefully we won't, we won't have that anymore. Yes. I just have a question with you. When you do your online lighting, you, you guys went to the point where you have to buy your general game app. Right. Do you guys refund that if you're unsuccessful? Someone we, told me you did. We gave we give you we gave you the option. Yeah, we gave you the option for those people. There, there's a. It's different in our state. We have, we have people that exclusively deer gun hunt. Yeah. They don't they don't want to do anything else. Right. And if and if they were if they were unsuccessful, then then they would be given the option to get general game refunding. But yeah, there's so it's it's not a it's not a lot compared to the, the majority of the applicants that apply, but right. we do offer that option have in the past. So okay. that'll help that it'll help alleviate all those little pieces that we had to put in place with the Some, with that. Someone told me well, I don't get my money back. No, you did you do. Yeah. Okay. If you want it, but Someone, yeah. If you want it, you can get it back. Right. So right. Mm -hmm. yeah, Dave. On the other side of Scotty's comment about the interest that you're not gonna get about the fees that cost the credit cards how much does it cost you to process that um, with the credit right card company what's the law yeah department on the yeah so i think your typical credit card transaction fees are around three percent and so 
uh, for the sake of math and just keeping it nice and clean, we always just left it an even number. We're paying those credit card transaction fees. And we, we've known those, we've known that traffic has been going up for a long time. In fact, when we, even before we made the decision to go online exclusively, we knew that was occurring. You know, we had from every lot, you saw a Bighorn Sheep application come in and at one point it got to be 90% of them were done online and 10% of them were filled out on paper forms. It was that information of all those lotteries that helped us make the decision online for each of those, each of those, we can step through some of them, but but yeah, it is something that as more of those transactions happen online, those those credit card transaction fees do go up for us. So why aren't we paying the fees as Hunter uh, instead of you guys paying the fees? Folks are huge fans of license fee increases, but I mean, I mean that's something we'll have to consider. I mean, we try to try to afford it with the other the other fees that we have on there. And so at some point when we get there, if credit card transaction fees continue to grow, which they will, as we get more and more uh, business online. Well, almost all they all they all, have is credit card. Now. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're just not trying to work within the means still, but at some point, yeah, we'll, we'll have to address probably have to address that. We're still paying them. It's just is it is it's part of that. So if it's a twenty a thirty dollar license, we're paying the fee, and then the twenty seven or whatever, someone with better better math can do that right away. Twenty seven or whatever that would be going on to um, the license. But yeah, there's other agencies that are doing that. You'll see DOTs and some of these other agencies are going. You know, just make it crystal clear. Here's the license fee, and here's the credit card transaction fee. The customer sees it when they check out. Yeah, we passed on to the non-resident fees. We did. We had, <laughs> we had. We did have that uh, several sessions ago, where it was, you know, some non-residents come in and spend, you know, a few hundred dollars on licenses, and they would go through a vendor, and the vendors were eating those fees because they had to pay them. So they're basically translating the the fees over for Game and Fish, and then they're eating those fees <laughs> for their as that, as that merchant. But. I don't know if this is a question for you, but when uh, non-resident tags or even resident tags, you know, we used to be able to buy them at Shields. Mm -hmm. And so like my daughter is a non-resident now, I have friends that come in and in the past we could order the tag and they, they, want, they want to mail it out, which I understand, but it takes a week. You never know how long it's going to take now with the post office. In the past, I've asked, them to hold them and they've been very good about it this year I asked and the lady wasn't very happy with me she said that it wasn't going to be that way anymore that you're either going to have to order it ahead of time which I struggle with if that's the way we're going because it doesn't take anything to set it in the back and have someone come in here and pick it up right you don't always know when you're yeah. going to hunt off I mean sometimes at the spur of the moment you want to come back home and hunt um, and you don't have your tag and if you ordered online you know a lot of states it's all online and you got it right there in your you know in your palm of your hand but we don't so are you guys looking at doing that we are we're, we're continually looking at ways to improve that i, I know some of the, the wardens will plug their ears a little bit here but i mean we're looking at things from e-tagging like what some other states are doing too just trying to find the right way to deliver some of that those offer some great opportunities for people but yeah just just when you have that point you know we do mass printing so we do that frequently with bow licenses. Right. And so that comes in, you just print a, a big batch and then the next person calls and says, when are you printing that next big batch to send out? Cause we get it, we get it printed and kicked out and sent to the post office. It's like every day, it's like at two o'clock. Well, yeah, well, several, it depends on, I mean, we try to do it as frequently as we can, but it is a, it is a circus sometimes when it gets really busy to say, you know, start pulling stuff aside. And, and so we're continuing looking at that if there's other ways and we've made some changes. Uh, we did it with Turkey you know, letting folks determine if they want to stop in and pick it up in an office. Um, so yeah, there's some, there's been some changes that we've made in the past to kind of accommodate that to, for people that did want to stop in and pick it up. But yeah, we're thinking of a lot of options for that, just kind of help out with that. Yep. Any other questions on purchasing or? Thank you, Brian. Back to you. Greg, do you want to do a fisheries update? Just a couple minutes on fishing, in particular the fishing regulations. And to piggyback on what Scott talked about a little bit earlier on the deer, on the deer um, guides. This is your fishing guide, a lot different. It's 50 pages long. Now, just a point of reference, you know, as times have changed, 
If you go back about 20, 25 years ago, we used to print 120,000 of these a year. Then it went to 80,000. And then I think more recently, it's about 35,000. And today we sell a lot more fishing licenses than we did 25 years ago. So this is not being used like it once was, it's being replaced by this. And that's just a sign of the times. So, it, you know, in time, perhaps the fishing guide will be totally on your phones also. <clears throat> FY. Um, fishing proclamation, kind of some boring stuff, but regulations. Every, again, and many of you know this, maybe some don't, but we, it's on like the hunting regulations are for a two year period. And so we set regulations and they'll be, the new ones will become effective April 1st of 2024. So in the oh, last summer, last fall, the biologists start talking about changes. And we probably always have maybe 30 regulations that say either that came from us or came from the public to, to consider and we narrow them down because we don't like change. Um, but you know we'll, we'll we'll address anything we get. In the end, this year, this go round is much like other years. No major major regulation changes are being proposed. I just want to share with you a couple that are that maybe a little more significant. Uh, one is that uh, we're going to establish a catfish a channel catfish limit. Uh, right now, it's the only game fish that we don't have a game uh, a limit on. Uh, we do have one east of highway in the eastern third of the North Dakota. We have a, a limit with the Red River catfish, but we're going to put one on in this part of the state also. It's going to be quite liberal, 20 daily, 40, and, <coughs> but it, we want to put some sideboards on it. And something else we've learned over the years, we want to bring up the importance of catfish. And a way of doing that is by putting limits on them. People find more interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, really didn't have much discussion today on the hunting side with archery, but I think everybody knows how that's expanded and grown so much in the state. And it's also spilled over to fishing. There's a lot of interest and we're seeing a growing, you know, it's not a significant by any stretch, but there is a growing fraternity of people that go out and bow fish. Currently the way it is in North Dakota, it's only non game fish. And there's been a request by a couple individuals, a couple groups for a number of years, and uh, we've entertained a couple things that we're going to look at allowing starting again next year. One would be allowing archery equipment for dark spear spearfishing if you do that. Um, I don't know if anybody does, but if you do it right now, you know it's just pike, pike and non-game fish for this year, dark calls. We'd also allow archery bowl along with that. Um, and then also we allow catfish on the Missouri River system um, to, to be able to use archery equipment. It'll only be on the Missouri River system proper. It certainly would not be on the Red River and all these. But, so we're just trying to expand some opportunity there. Another issue that's actually kind of a recent one, it's hard for me to believe that Trapping your own bait has just gone. I mean, if you go back in any old timers in here, you probably did trap your own bait. I mean, 50 years ago, that basically people trap their own bait. Now you just go up to your local retail. There's a new renewed interest in trapping minnows, and it's not so much fathead minnows, but crick chubs. Everybody needs crick chubs to catch big walleye, you know, on and on. So, and what we're seeing is a lot of interest in that. Game, game wardens and the public are having some of their coming across traps that are people are stealing their, their bait or, to, or pulling the, the traps out and leave them on shore and stuff like that. So, and then we've been a little bit lax in that. So we're going to require just simply, uh, it will be a violation in the future if you do it. And also that you have to some way, somehow just uh, identify your traps. So we, so we know whose it is. So that's something to kind of look forward to. Maybe the last thing I want to share is just if there's any interest here. Does any, anybody paddlefish snag up at Confluence? Okay, in the theme of archery, there's been a request for some time to also allow archery, bull fishing, along with, you know, casting your treble hooks. Uh, and that's been, a, that's been out there for a long time. A lot of states, most states allow it. It's not new. I mean, this would not be something that's new to North Dakota. I mean, you'd be extremely limited. Anybody that, that snags knows anything about it. The water is as brown as brown can be. So it's not 
Um, you're not going to see much. And if we were to allow it, they'd have to have it follow the same rules as uh, snagging, which means not from bolts. You'd have to do it from shore also. Great. <laughs> Check on that, sir. Uh, Montana allows one tag per person per year, only in the dredge cuts off uh, Fort Peck. But down in South Dakota, they allow it south of Yankton. But you get into a lottery system down there for there. I have done both. But it is very tough. But in both cases you're speaking of, that's much clearer water, too. Yes. Um, there are some guys that do shore fish it in Montana and also uh, down there, too. But uh, it's, it's pretty tough. Yeah. It, it is very tough. But when you're looking at that, it would just be stuck up to the northwest corner of the stage, not any other section of the river. No, no, it'd be just I, where the legal area is right now. If it would ever go. Does anybody have any strong feelings one way or the other? When we go to Montana, it's a $50 tag to do it. So it is an additional tag onto our normal uh, fishing lines. Like I said, South Dakota is a lottery system down there. South Dakota is very open to everything. But uh, most people are down there salmon bull fishing right now. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we had an 89 pounder, but the Montana record's 130, I think, right now on on yeah, barrel. Yeah, it's, it's just without it's it's holding intense. on holding on to string. But Mon the no, Montana they, open, it, but... they open it up just because it does bring a lot of people to their state just to do that. Yeah. And same thing with South Dakota does. It brings a lot of people to their state just because you can target walleye, white bass, crappie, everything during daylight out. Well, I don't know if you necessarily want to bring more people to that fishery. If you're ever up there, it's shoulder to shoulder. And it, I know oftentimes a short season is four days. Um, but we did actually, we did do a telephone survey this fall asking the snaggers, the active snaggers this year, what their thoughts were. I forget the percentage, but the vast majority I think it's three fourths of them we didn't have a problem with it. But. I'd like to see somebody. It, it gets drugged down the shore. It's a challenge with big fish. Um, some places you go to other states to do it. There's no limit on, on spoonies in Kentucky and some other yeah. states. There's no limit on them. But I know, like our ecosystem up here, but even this stretch of river, there's no natural predator on them other than a boat. But like I said, it's tough no matter what when you're short. <laughs> I appreciate anything that we get for the sport in North Dakota. It does help bring people here. So I've been seeing a couple more people coming from out of state too. So. Yes, sir. Greg, I didn't get in earlier on the boat ramp conversation. Um, I know the city's got plans for renovation yeah. of the uh, Merriweather's ramp. Um, well, that's still I don't know if it's so much renovation as removal. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. It, it, did the renovation plan still include a boat ramp? Or Not that I'm aware of. Really? No, it's, you know, but the, the net, as was mentioned, Jeb mentioned, you know, the, the car bodies is very alive, and that's how like, now likely it's going to occur. So, I mean, it's only got to drive all the way around, but at least if you're from Mandan, Morton County, you like that idea, but it, it'll be, it'll be the, you know, the same number of boat ramps, just, uh, Changing around, and we again, we'd like to, you know, we have a couple other ramps. Nifle's a bit of an issue, always is with sediment, and <laughs> that's not going away. And then uh, we really like to get Kimball down here in the desert up and running again to be more dependable during low flows. Thanks for putting the one in on course I'd like. I went out there a few times, I love it. It's a start, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. But I think we're going to do something more there, right, Paul? That's still the plan? Yeah, we're just waiting on the core permits for there as well to make some improvements there, given the, how flat that ramp is and the uh, the sediment that's building up there, too. To, pretty shallow, yeah. If you're familiar with, like, the Cherry Lake ramp right near there or Sibley Lake, yeah. where we actually built a little bit more of a peninsula out into the lake to get you better slope. Uh, and then uh, you'll get just got the metal grate at Horsehead right now, and as it's silting up, as opposed to some real challenges for clearing the silt off. You know, if we go there with a skid steer, we can't scrape down to the metal because we'll tear up the metal ramp. So we're, we're hoping to replace that with concrete next year, which will be a, a little hitch in the giddy up for everyone trying to fish there for a, you know, a month or so, but uh, we'll end up with a much better product there probably. The fishing application 
tournament application on the computer. Is that any time ready? Very soon, right, Brian? We're, we're getting yeah. real. <laughs> so what, what do you want us to do in the meantime here? We have some tournaments coming up, one in February, of course, one in May, and one comes yeah. after the April deadline. I know the advisory board meetings are coming, or the other meetings are December by me. Do you want us to put in the paper application or pa just wait? Put in the paper for your winter tournament. It's all winter tournaments are the same old, same old. Okay. Moving forward, April 1st, any open water tournament moving after that is all going to be online though. Okay. And those Brian's will, yeah. been working with those that. will be available December one for those those next season summer tournaments. Okay. Yep. It'll be online. It'll, It'll be, be online. It'll be online, yep. Yes, sir. I heard something about uh, they were gonna drain Hartview Dam to fix the glory hole. That's uh they that's yeah, that was like five years ago. There was some I know, but I mean No, that they they apparently they modified their plans dramatically. Okay. It was a, actually it was an eighty foot drawdown. It was been significant. And I don't know what what they came up with, but they got some alternative and I I don't know if it's they drain that lake. Yeah, that would be that had been basically draining our view. Uh, they're not gonna do it? They're not gonna do Nothing that dramatic. I don't. I don't know what the plans are, but they they backed away from that for sure. Hey, thank you. Okay, great. Yep. Big game. Yep. Are you going to do that? Yep. Yep. I'll give a quick update. Just a few big game items. We already hit on the elk antlers depredation license earlier. Um, that was one of the updates that we wanted to give. Um, the other thing, uh, one of the other topics we wanted to hit on is we have some changes with our chronic waste and disease uh, proclamation. And so just wanted to update you on, on some of those. Uh, our carcass transportation rules had changed. Um, if you remember before we had, we had to stay within a chronic waste and disease unit. Um, and then that was effective when it was, you know, just an isolated unit here and there, but as chronic waste and disease spread across the state and it became, um, you know, less useful where Folks are able to just drive around to Minot and they gotta go north, take different roads. And so, anyways, we're we're now to the point of education for folks to to either keep that carcass on site in that unit, um, you know, preferably at the site of where you harvest it, or if you bring it home, get it in the landfill. That's the message that we really want folks to understand is either keep it on site or if you bring it back, take it to a landfill. Not landfill, that doesn't mean you have to take it there. You can put it in your own in your garbage here if you're in town and for pickup yep uh, is that ever going to change for out of state <clears throat> bringing a deer out of state you know like we can't bring in a full skull right out of state with brain intact so if i shoot a deer i don't want to mount i have to either boil it there find a tax term right. to do it. um is there going to be any changes with that as far as I, skull even not even just bringing the whole deer just bringing the skull in because i'm not going to go dump that skull or right. the, uh brain in my field <laughs> right uh, I would say probably unlikely. You know, that's probably not something what, that we're going to do. What is the reasoning behind that? Um, same thing, risk management. Um, just trying to re trying to reduce that risk, um, you know, of having that disease spread into the state even. Because some of these places have significantly higher prevalence as well. And so that brain material and also the spinal cord, we definitely want to avoid that. So, yeah, yeah, that's a good question, though. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're, that's what was one of the changes we were looking at. Um, second, uh, how we sample in the state. Uh, you know, in the past, we've always sampled every year in those CWD units. Now we're going to a four year rotation. And so we're focusing on the Southeast part of the state this year, we Northeast and then uh, Northwest, Southwest, and again, in a four year rotation. So, so we'll make it around. It got a little difficult and unpractical for our staff to be able to spread you know, half the state, then try to get some samples in the Northeast, uh, Southeast. And so it just became unpractical for our staff to be able to, to go everywhere. And so that's where we're really focused on a, a quarter of the state. Um, now we will take samples from anywhere uh, free. Um, and all of our game and fish offices have, uh, you could bring them in for, to remove the lymph nodes or drop barrels at those locations, self sample kits. Um, so there's different, plenty of different options for, uh, for folks to submit samples throughout the state. We're happy to take those uh, from anybody that they want. But as far as the focus area and having those uh, barrels, that's where we really have it in the Southeast. Yeah. So question for you. So I've listened to the past meetings. We talked about EHD. It's a disease. It can't be controlled, correct? There's not, we didn't spend any money on it, right? Uh, 
we're I doing mean, some loop it out. We're look we're collecting samples right now. Okay. Um, in these areas that were hit, where we're collecting blood samples, trying to determine if some of these deer that did actually survive, yeah. um, if they did have EHD, and then looking at some of the genetics possibly, and and trying to see if there's a little bit more. So we're we're looking at that as well. What's what it, so with the testing of CWD? Yeah, I totally understand it, but mm -hmm. what what's our end game? So we're at 0.0001 percent um, infection rate. So if we go to 10 percent, or if we go to 5 percent, so we CWD is not controllable. There's no cure for it. However you want to look at it, believe Dusty's science or you guys' science. So we spent. I don't know what mo amount of money we're spending. I know there's a lot on advertisement right now. Um, advertisement is not cheap. Um, and we're trying to educate people, but th what's the end game to this? So are we, yeah, what's, we can't control it. Yep. We're, we're trying to manage it, but there's no way to manage it. The only management I've seen anybody do is come in and wipe out deer herds. Yeah, so that's a good question. So what, what is the hope? And, and our hope is to slow the spread as much as possible. Um, and that that is really the hope, and but we have been how, and not get hot, different hot spots. So how how okay, I understand that. Yeah. So, so how one I guess would be down. with transportation, right? Because uh, where we have had positives in the past have made sense, right? It it started in three F two and it slowly has spread from there. Three A one in Northwest from um, Montana and Canada, um, and so we've had these these and other ones in Montana, but it's made sense, right? It hasn't been all of a sudden one isolated location where it's like where did this come from, right? So then we do look at our transportation rules and then also just our, our hunters really being um, good about that and not dumping carcasses on the landscape. And so that's one thing is obviously we don't wanna have that. But um, the other thing is we don't know what the future will be. Right now, there isn't. Uh, likely in the future, maybe there won't be any uh, options, but, but maybe there will be. So the longer we can keep a low prevalence, the better. And the slower we could, have that spread the better and so some of the different tools that we'll use is is maybe how we allocate some of the tags um you know and might be a little reducing that density a little bit in some locations and so so there is some tools that way but yeah it, it's kind of a daunting thing is no doubt so if it's so contagious bill why are we sending in the tongues and feces and urine i never got any documents from you guys saying it spreads through bodily fluids it's so contagious prions are everywhere through the bodily fluids why are we testing the salivary gland? Why are we testing the tongue species? I mean, the science show, I mean, that's where we detected it. You it's have no science. Out. I asked for it. You don't have any irrefutable evidence, Bill. Let's see, have you ever, um, if you go to Google, scholar.google, you can look up some multiple. I mean, I'm working with there, that. There, that there, there's system. plenty of science on it, and there's a lot. And I guess what we look at is the peer reviewed science, and, and that's really where we follow. Pathology okay. doesn't lie, Bill. <laughs> And I get it. You could, there's all sorts of stuff that we could search on the internet, and, the, and there's all sorts of information. And, uh, and it's definitely a tough subject. There's no doubt about it. So, I guess yeah. the, the thing I'm that there's, I'm not seeing the end game. I saw what was our number of deer we lost last year because of winter. Yep. You know, 40,000, 50,000 because of starvation. Yeah, I mean, it, it and definitely was severe right. to the so, east. Yeah. But we thought about, and I know game of fish is, and when I talk about feeding, I'm talking about food plots and crops. We got farmers and ranchers across that without them having haystacks, having standing corn, things like that, we'd had a lot more loss. We have, there's guys I know out east that fed a lot of bales and things like that. They also have organizations that will, um, wildlife fund will put uh, a fund together, pay a farmer or rancher to leave 20 acres of beans, 20 acres of corn, and they pay them so that if it's a bad winter, the deer have something to eat. Um, and then the farmer can come back in that spring and if there's anything left, harvest it. Yep. Have we thought about doing anything like that? Because we, yeah. we basically know where the deer winter almost every year. Yep. They kind of go to their wintering grounds and we thought about spending some of the money that we're spending other places that maybe to put in more food plots, more habitat on some yep. of these places. And I know it all takes money. No, I, those are those are great points, John. I mean, they really are, and that is something that we have thought about um, from a depredation standpoint. We do offer food plots with our depredation program, and it wouldn't necessarily be right where that individual is experiencing the depredation. Maybe a mile or a couple miles or a few miles away, it might be a different neighboring landowner, and so that is something we're looking at. Is like 
like you said, it's big complexes where there's maybe six landowners are having a lot of depredation. Can we find some locations in there for food plots? And I'm not talking like two acres. I'm no, talking, talking 40, about, yeah. 50, 60 that acres. You need it, it, big, and so and have them next to quality habitat, shelter belts, or areas like that where where those deer will, will have good shelter. And so that is something that we're really looking at. And and with our program, if a landowner does do that, they don't need to provide access. And they can they have to leave that stand till March 1st after that. And then obviously last winter the snow's so deep, you know, it takes care of itself. They're not gonna be harvesting that until well into April. And so, but if we have an open winter, then that is available in March and they could graze it, they could harvest it, whatever. So so that's a pretty good option. And so that's something we'd really like to expand upon. Um, because that is that is a great point for sure. So this yeah. has been labeled since the nineteen sixty seven bill. So over fifty years, say sixty years. Isn't the definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results? Testing, 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 and testing, and testing, and testing, and detecting. And... Yeah, I mean, like Jeff, like Jeff said, I mean, everybody has their different opinions. Certain so appreciate to, to hear yours, but yeah, I mean, really our focus is on habitat. Like John mentioned it, really trying to provide the best habitat we can out there, but it's EHD or whatever it might be so that we can recover, you know? So that includes, you know, Fawning or nesting habitat and also winter habitat. Yeah, you had a question? Just have an answer door to the discussion here. I heard on the radio the other day that Yellowstone had his first incidence of uh, CWD. Yeah, I saw that as well. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. See where that goes. Yes. So some of the money that we're, and I don't know how the money is allocated. Are, are we able to use some of that money that if we are getting the federal grant, I don't know if it's whatever it is, $40 million, $70 million, it got to be used just for CWD. Or can it be used for habitat? Can it be used for food plots and things like that? To, you know, to me, you look at Wisconsin, who's they got the highest deer population they've ever had, and they have a high prevalence of CWD. And it seems like CWD doesn't kill fast enough on the white-tailed deer. It may be different on mule deer. I don't know, but to allocate some of that money to the private landowners to put in those plots next to the good habitat, or to get them to leave more habitat. Because I see the big thing is out east versus west as far as habitat from what I see. Yeah, I agree. It's worth a lot of money out there farming. Mm -hmm. And we, we can't expect a farmer out there to right. we give him $2 an acre yeah. or $5 an acre. Exactly. You got to pay him for what his crop is worth. And so how do we do that? And if we do have federal money or we can uh, apply for grants for something like that to increase some of that. No, th those are all good questions with uh, with funding. And so we don't receive any special funding for chronic waste disease sampling or anything like that. But, you know, our Pittman Robinson money, that's what Jeb was talking about from the excise tax on equipment. That's what we're using and that's what we're using for habitat work. And so you can only do so much because we do pay full land rent rate on, on those properties where we plant idle grass. And then on top of that, we provide an access payment as well. But still, it's only so competitive, uh, you know, and for a lot of these landowners. And so um, they really want to have to put their land in that conservation program. Yeah. North Dakota is one of the wealthiest states in the country. Yeah. You guys are supposed to have power with our legislature. Why can't you go to them with all the money this state has and have them allocate so many dollars to the North Dakota Game and Fish every year don't go begging for it go and tell them we have this excess money in north dakota no. <laughs> get some money from the state they got the damn money instead of giving it to every outfit that comes in and yeah. out for a nickel and a dime it is true i mean one thing that we do take pride in as hunters and as the game and fish department is we're self-funded you know <laughs> this is the money that we have you guys generate it you generated it from hunting. You can it's only a, generate so much because of the place. I hear you. Yep. <laughs> that's you know, I was, appreciate your confidence in this, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, one of the challenges with that though too is that, you know, again, any anytime, anytime you are an agency that does get allocations from the general fund, then you also have to live with the years when that fund isn't very high. And, you know, I mean, who, you know, who knows? I mean, we've obviously any, any state any state general tax fund is going to see its ebbs and flows. We're we're for, a little more fortunate in North Dakota with you know of course oil oil dollars, but you know that's not a that's not going to be a forever type thing either. So you know again it, it is one of those challenges. And um, does a person really want to be attached to that? 
to a general tax fund scenario to where the department does have the support of, of hunters and anglers through license fees. And again, we're, we're able to match those dollars with the federal excise dollars that have been in place since you know 1937, which has been a you know successful system. Jim, to kind of go back to where I started with asking the same thing about looking for money from the general fund, how do I word this right way? Like, are you missing the big picture and not asking for money? Because right now, just just to say it, on the big game side of things, deer herd and where this deer herd has gone. And I understand that there's places in the state that deer herd is thriving, but there's a lot of places in the state that it's not. Are you guys running the risk by not going to the general fund for management dollars of losing long-term picture, losing hunter revenue? Because as we go down this road and we don't have the opportunities because of habitat, um, because of things like EHD, because of hard winters, mountain lions, and not to piss anybody off in the room, but archery hunters in the western part of the state and, and the mule deer population, um, would we be better off to ask for general fund dollars to fund some of these things like you're talking about where we you can come to, to guys like me and John and have land and, and, and any other ranchers in the room and say, hey, can we have this 40 or 50 acres to plant a sorghum corn cover crop mixture so you have a place to go instead of relying on, on hunter dollars and, and grant money. Um, you know, long long term picture looking at this here losing you guys are flirting with losing hunting population because the opportunities are dwindling in this in this state. The answer to that question was during our subcommittee hearing our appropriations. Jeb was up there asking for our own dollars, our very own dollars, a little extra. What was it? Two and a half million for the Metal Arc Initiative and another additional just an appropriation just I mean, for not, our own money not for spending right. authority you know and spending what authority we're here is going well we're taking good land that's good farmland and taking that out of production we're going you guys are the ones that have to say this is something we want this is something that we're okay with because that's what we hear was going we're taking and, and we're I, trying to feed the world here we don't want to take land out of good land out of production and that's what we hear and so we had a very very hard time getting just that amount of money that we were asking for of our own money spending authority spending authority so let's just i just watched this episode um uh, steve Bernella is whatever he is sure yeah they just did an episode on Aberdeen, South Dakota, and pheasant hunting, and I think they have something called the Pheasant Hunting Coalition down in Aberdeen. Yep. Um, and, and to approach it and maybe look at it a marketing point of view for you guys is, is to approach some of these smaller towns that do see, uh, uh, and where I'm going with this, they do see an impact from um, $100, whether it's some people might not like them for saying them, whether it's out of staters or whether it's in staters, but it, the number that they threw out in this episode was um, pheasant hunting gener dollars generated for Aberdeen, South Dakota in a season of $16.5 million for the community of Aberdeen alone. The money that hunters are bringing into the community. Um, so from Game and Fish's point of view, why don't you approach the small towns like Flasher and Carson and say, hey, help us help you guys generate more money and bring us more taxpayer revenue. And, and, and what I understood of the Aberdeen Coalition for Pheasant Hunters is they took that money and they took part of that, that, that tax base that was brought in for sales tax. And, and the city itself has approached landowners and put something like four or 5,000 acres of pheasant hunting habitat around the greater Aberdeen area. But it, I, I strongly feel, and, and some of this is based off of just last weekend, we were in Unit 4C. Um, my dad and I have hunted, I'm 42 years old to give the room credit, and there's probably very few people in this room that can say that they, I've hunted Unit 4C for 29 years in a row. Um, I'm a veteran, I was gone for five years in the Navy, I made a, at least a one day trip to Unit 4C every year for the last 29 years. Unit 4C being that that's my place to go hunt is sad. Um, 
when I was a 12, 13, 14 year old kid, it was not uncommon for us to go for a drive in the morning and see 150, 200 head of mule deer. Um, when I was a kid, I didn't have any deer. My dad and I <laughs> on Thursday morning, and we put at least eight miles of mule deer on the ground. And I can I can hit on that topic on. too. Yeah. And we saw this is an actual number. The number was two to one bighorn sheep to be there. We saw 20 big horn sheep and 10 million. We, we've got 10 minutes left here. And yep. let's let, let's let people yeah. talk yep. about that topic, which yep. you know, we know people want to hear about. Yep, I'll slide into that real quick because that's that's a very key thing that we want to talk about. First of all, just talk about where our status is of our mule deer right now. And uh, so we're able to survey that in the spring and the fall and spring before the leaves come on, the fall after the leaves come off. And so much different than white-tailed deer where we rely on snow cover on the landscape, at least a foot uh, on the level. So we get little glimpses here and there. Last year, we had a really good glimpse because unfortunately we had deep snow across the state. Uh, but mule deer, we really have a really good indication of what's going on. We, we know we, what you're talking about, we see. We see it in our data, we see it when we're surveying. And, and certainly that's that's what we're finding too, is our, our mule deer down and, and the cause uh, is low fawn production last three years. So we look at three years ago, we had a severe drought and a severe drought has much impact is this past winter, a tough winter on the fawn production. Very similar, this this last uh, fall we, is actually the lowest fawn production that we've uh, recorded, um, but that drought year was really, really close to that. And then to, uh, last, so this, so we had the drought, then we had the late uh, snowstorm in the spring and it was after we even counted uh the deer uh so it was like what april you guys remember that snowstorm that had a huge impact and then of course this bad winter so we were going on three consecutive years of poor production not only uh difficult for the adults to survive but uh, low production so with that we've been very conservative with our gun tag allocations and so our population <laughs> is okay it's much lower than it had been we were looking at over 10 deer per square mile and now we're probably below six, um, but it's certainly, you know, a population that will recover. Um, so that's kind of where we're sitting right now. On the other subject that you brought up was the archery side of things, right? So that's a hot topic and one that we've involved um, some of our hunting organizations to, to provide input, um, different hunters that are avid hunters to, to help us gauge this and figure it out where, where we should go, because that's a tough one. Um, so what we did is we contracted out uh, a survey to hunters and we just did that. Um, we reached out to, uh, I think it was 8,000 hunters. We received a 50% response. We had over 4,000 response. That was landowners, gun hunters, bow hunters, and then gun people that do gun and bow. So it was a very good mix of all of those. And we had a very good response and we got a lot of data. We just got it back. And like I said, we contracted that out. Um, and we get, and we're just got just the uh, just the raw data. So they're compiling that and they're breaking that down, and they're going to get that to us soon. But basically, the gist of it is, yeah, the the public indicated that it's crowded out there, um, especially if you're anywhere near a road. Um, if you walk way back in, you can kind of get away from it. Um, it's gun hunters as well. Gun hunters indicated probably crowding more than the archery hunters, honestly. Um, the other thing that we did see is that that our constituents are looking for us to allocate archery tag numbers consistent with where the uh, population is. And that's something we haven't done in the past. It's over the counter uh, unlimited license. Um, you, know, you can hunt anywhere in the state as a resident. So as a non-resident, it's a little bit different. Um, those hunters then be, as I think I mentioned before, 15% of the previous years gun mule deer tag allocation is how we determine that. So the previous year, so unfortunately for this year, our non-resident allocation is a little higher than we want it to be because we had a big drop uh, this year in gun tag allocations, but it's the previous year. So, so that's uh, where we're at and we're gonna, so the process now is we're gonna meet together with that group. We're gonna come, we're gonna look at the data. We have a lot of data um, from three years of surveys that we've done with hunters as well that tells us where they're hunting, what time of year they're hunting the most. All that all that information really helps us make good decisions along with what our constituents want. And we're gonna come up with some different alternatives to consider. And <coughs> we're gonna do some public meetings spread across the state, probably late winter, spring, something like that. Um, 
we'll be we'll see when that is um but fairly soon and and see if if change is needed if it is what that looks like and i know it's going to be one that we're not going to have everybody agreeing upon it's it's definitely one of those difficult situations no doubt about it so um one of the online questions that we had uh, was what's the possibility of steps taken for resident bow hunters to have one week without non-residents similar to other seasons and so that is part of the options that we have for the badlands as well is do we need to look it's residents and non-residents there's no doubt it's it's both that are causing the crowding um, but from the non-resident side we'll look at different options such as this to see if that should be something that we should consider so um that's kind of the gist on the Badlands thing. I would like to get some feedback from you guys regarding that, if or if you have any questions on that or observations. Real quick. Yeah. Yeah. What about a draw for new deer archery? Yeah, that's that's certainly one of the things that we're we're considering. That'll be one of the discussion topics that we'll have with that small group, and then depending on what we decide, that that might be something we bring forth to the public is is something to consider. Mm -hmm. So. One one thing is I'd say is that bow hunters do appreciate having that ability to hunt anywhere in the state, and I get that. So that's what we need to determine if we're able to maintain that or not. So yeah, non-resident bow tag. That's that's the whole state any any year. Yep, it, yep, yep. That one that but that's limited. So that's there's 860 some this year. That's how many of those now. If non-resident wants to come and hunt a white-tailed deer, that's that is over the counter they can buy. Not in the state for white tail. I guess I did restrict the residents on the building for restrict the residents, I guess. Yeah, and and like I said, we'll look at both sides. Yeah. That's really the same question. Yep. That. You know, you can't you can't change the fifty percent non resident mule deer tag, but you do have the control to, you know, aim these people where they can go and where they yeah. can as non residents. So yep. that is an option, I think that we yep. can look at. Absolutely. That's, a, that's something we're definitely going to look at is do we need to look at where those tags are derived from? For example, 15% for A, do we we have those 100 stay at that 100 of them or whatever that is in that unit? And then do we, if we do that, how do we go about that? Can they hunt there or the rest of the state? There's a lot of detail. It sounds easy, but then you dig into it and you, you don't want to have, I would say, like unintended consequences. Like we're trying to reduce the pressure, but maybe we increase the intensity of the hunting pressure. Is so. any idea of how, how many, what percentage of non-resident bow hunters actually go just to go to the, just to go look for a Right. Um, so that's what we're going to look at this year with the serving these hunters this year, those 800 <laughs> and, and 60 or so. We're going to survey every one of them and, and ask that question. That's something we're really going to dig into a lot more. Is it where are they going? You know, the success rates looking at that actually are fairly very similar with residents and non-residents. Uh, I looked at that here today a little closer, and um, and it, and the success rate on archery in the Badlands is fairly low. However, the the pressure is quite high, and so in those 4B, 4C, 4D, the, the harvest is getting very similar between gun hunters and archery hunters. That's gun hunters still slightly higher, but um, it's just that there's a lot more effort put in. No, the success is lower. So, yeah. So it's definitely a complicated one. It's one that a lot of different sides to it. Um, but we're definitely going to dig into it. We've heard enough about it that it's something that it's it's a priority for us to to consider. Yeah. It's like Montana has the come home to hunt thing. If you're born in Montana, you're you're treated more like a resident. Yeah, they have a kind of a discount. Yeah. You know. Would that help to bring people back that are from here that moved out of state? You know? That's certainly something I could consider. Obviously, that would take legislative action because that would probably be a special uh, license that we don't have right now. Um, or even happen. something I've thought about as a landowner, you get your tag, allowing a grandkid or a, you know, a direct blood family member to have their name on that tag, on the tag where grandpa goes out with grandkids. He may love to hunt, but he'd rather see his grandchildren or a close family member harvest that game where we're keeping grandpa, dad, grandkids <coughs> out in the field against hunting. If it wouldn't have been for my dad and aunts and uncles, I probably wouldn't have never hunted. Yeah. Perhaps I had somebody, for me, I probably had 25 adults that were more than willing to take me hunting when I was a little kid. Yeah, you're right. I, I mean, how hungry I was, but. Yeah. 
continue to find more ways to get our youth away from their cell phones and video games. That's what I, I guess I'd have it. That's a really good point. That's a challenge I'd put to all of you is try to take one youth hunter this next year. You know, that's it's tough. I know we only have so much time, each one of us, to go hunting. Try to take somebody else. Um, I know I've done that. You know, my kids are 14 and 18 now, and so I've taken their friends that have never been exposed to hunting before. It's it's pretty crazy how if you just get them going a little bit, and then all of a sudden there's so many resources out there. But to get that start. And then you're a resource for them to call because, you know, we try to keep our regulations simple, but the fact is that it can get a little confusing and daunting for, for folks. And so, yeah, they, it, they need a mentor. And so I, I guess that's something to keep in mind that's if you guys want to do that. Look. Finding the ability for that tag to have somebody that has to be there, you know, whether that kid gets a new tag, you know, that might save a way to go right now. You know, you're, you know, he's going to harvest the deer. There's only going to be one deer for the 200. Thing, yeah, but having be able to put more than just the landowner's name or the grand yeah. person's name, it's a little complicated, obviously, from enforcement things, so yeah. but yeah, it's but way too point well taken for sure. Yeah, just to think outside the box sometimes. Yeah, yeah. well, good. Yeah, right. one last question, Quick probably. Question. Yeah, um, has there any, any looking at um, like South Dakota does with a special peg for antelope or deer where somebody can apply in a different pool that's strictly just for private land? Oh, you know, yep. Like yep. North Dakota yep. is so overrun. Yeah. Um, would that be an option we could look yeah. at? Even, even uh, mm -hmm. an extended uh, price range on those, you know, mm -hmm. um, just to give people more options. No, I, I guess what he's discussing is South Dakota has some options to where those tags maybe would be restricted to private land versus being able to hunt the public land. Because that's really what we're talking about is the pressure on that public lands is, is really um probably the biggest issue i would say but from hearing from the landowners too there's some other concerns it's just it's busy out there it's really busy with everybody so so it's a little bit more than that but that absolutely that is something that we're looking at and considering as well and that's a good point yep so yeah good discussions great discussion appreciate everybody's input and, and um questions and, and we'll be we'll be sticking around here as well so people can feel free to to do that as well still some uh, soft drinks back there and a few, few cookies anyway and, and um, so feel free to stick around but we do need, need three numbers Jody between one and 37 and one of the things I do want to say thank you to we have representative Karen Carls here and Senator Bame as well and so I uh, appreciate uh, appreciate those individuals that showed up Senator Bame might have snuck out but uh, he was here earlier so any appreciate that Watford City we had three legislators up there so it's always good to uh, to have that interaction and uh, representative carls has obviously been very good she's been a, a fixture at her advisory board meetings for many years so thanks again for your attendance um so numbers jody between one and 37. 4 15 and 36. 4 phil mastrangelo 15 pat winnegar and 36 jerry reinish so number one we have noise <coughs> goes to phil phil He's not getting cards to Oh man, you got jumping up. 15, <laughs> Pat Winnegar. This is a light. Yeah. yeah. Number two is not bad, Pat. You still have a choice anyway when it gets to get a three. Mug or this is a light. <laughs> it pops up and it's like lantern type. All right. <laughs> Last one was Gary Reinish in the back. Oh, there you in go. The bison shirt. Take <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. How are you doing? All right. Thanks again, everybody, for coming out. Appreciate the discussion. Everybody have a happy Thanksgiving.